I've left myself 14 minutes to answer the question that Yochai and I started from. But you understand that part of whatever answer I'm going to give is about people. It's about people whose concern for convenience is substantially less than their concern for freedom. I, I will say, somebody has to testify to this, that working for me is not convenient. Um, so the people out there in the world who are too easily swayed and seduced by convenience away from freedom are not this team. Uh, this team uh, is prepared to undergo some inconvenience for freedom, and therefore we are a poor sample of the human race with which to begin to answer Yochai's questions. <laughs> Here's what I've wanted to say about that all day long and what I have been learning again as I have been listening to all these presentations. The position from which Yochai and I now find ourselves after all these 25 years or more or less of thinking about these things together is that we are aware that what we did was very good and it is not enough and for the reason that he gave this morning. The layer of freedom that we thought that we could make and that would solve the problems of a net that could otherwise be built for despotism, the idea we had, the idea we got from Richard Stallman, which was that if we followed the rules of free software, if we shared in a commons respecting way, if we made share and share alike the basis of the infrastructure of the net, then we could preserve human liberty in the 21st century was an incomplete theorem. It was true in part, and the part that it was true of we were good at for quite a while. Here's why we were good at it for quite a while. I do think it's important to understand where the success came from. It came because Richard was a man who thought that everything was about trust and about keeping promises. So when I went to work for him in the early 90s, and I found myself trying to figure out the question, how could two guys with no resources uh, one foam rubber mattress, one back room at MIT, and one junior law professor job, how could we do this? I was very much helped by Richard's explaining to me what it was that he needed. What he needed, as he said in our first conversation on the subject, was never allow a demand for anything else, money or publicity or anything, interfere with a request for compliance. All we want is share and share alike. All we want is for people to keep their promises to others the way we kept our promise to them. That made it easy. I mean, it didn't make it totally easy, but it made it, from a lawyer's point of view, tractable. It reduced most of the kinds of friction and adversity and doubt which run into the relationship when you're a lawyer trying to do something new that other people haven't done before. It gave us more than a decade of opportunity to build respect for the principles upon which we operated. I think I understood this a little bit because I went to a Quaker college and I spent an awful lot of my first four years learning to be a historian, thinking about the history of the Society of Friends in America. So I understood how it could be that a community of people who lived by superior truthfulness and superior promise keeping could also earn a lot of money and build a lot of nice gardens around Philadelphia. That there was a win-win solution in that, in the idea that you hold to faith and you keep your promises and you embody trust and therefore other people trust you. And a decade of that gave us the high water mark of what we did. It didn't give it to us immediately, but it proposed the basis upon which everything else then happened. Because no matter what people thought of Richard Stallman, and they thought a lot of things of Richard Stallman, the one thing they didn't think was that Richard was going to wake up one morning and reverse any single promise he had ever made, or reconsider any single principle he had ever declared, or go back on any commitment that he had made. And lawyering for a client such as that is a pure joy. Not just because you don't have to wipe the scum off yourself at the end of the shift, but because you really can get a lot of work done in the world if that's the way you face the world. And we faced the world that way and we got a lot of work done. It wasn't enough. We thought it was. We really did. I, I, I certainly did. 
I, have, I stood in a lot of places at the beginning of the 21st century and summarized the cause of human freedom and felt to myself, as I said to the people listening to me, this time we win. And I think I probably felt that way until about the end of the last decade. I think I felt when we had finished GPL3 that we were well on course to win. We had made a better license. We had brought about significant patent sharing that wasn't there before. And we had begun to nullify the value of ammunition in a world we knew would go to patent war eventually. We had internationalized copyleft. I no longer had a license to explain to people which depended upon the, the ersatz idiosyncratic funniness of US patent law derivative works and such, and a technical de description of distribution in, and such, and just a vocabulary which lots of lawyers around the world were never going to get. We had achieved what I thought of as the most important legal elements of the revolution we thought we were winning. We had instantiated sharing, we had proved that trust worked, and we were spreading the zone of reciprocity both substantively and geographically and financially by orders of magnitude. I suppose, therefore, that it wasn't entirely ridiculous for us to think that we were winning. Microsoft was on the run. It could be seen that sooner or later the most deeply funded and powerful monopoly in the history of the world was going to adopt our way of doing things instead of trying to call it cancer. And so I suppose that it was not entirely incorrect to feel that this was going to work. But I, I missed something. I, I, from Yochai's point of view, I mean, I missed a lot of stuff. It took many slides this morning, as you remember, to show how much we missed. But I, I think what I really missed was that I didn't pay attention to my own former boss who put me in the world of this anyway. I, I started doing all of this because I worked once upon a time for a guy called Thurgood Marshall, and so I thought that I had learned that ordinary people who were just willing to keep pushing at it could change the world. I thought that that was what TM had taught me. That was certainly what I thought when I was a young law professor. That was what I thought when I went to work for Richard Stallman. I thought that I was following the boss's way of doing things. Um, and I should have noticed that by the time he and I parted, he had experienced what I'm experiencing now. We buried him in the winter of 1993, shortly after William Jefferson Clinton's inauguration on Robert E. Lee's front lawn. I think this is very important to point out given current conversation going on in American civilization. I think uh, it's really important for me to say again that compromise is not the way you do some things in life um, and that it is a deeply an important fact in the history of the United States of America, which I'm not sure that the current inhabitants down the hill from there fully understand that as a result of our determination for freedom, we buried Thurgood Marshall on Robert E. Lee's front lawn. Um, but when we did that, we were doing that in respect and love for somebody who had already gotten the news that I feel I am getting now. The last time we were all together, the last conversation I had with him in a group, we were coming off the... the decision by the United States Supreme Court in a case called McDowell against Oklahoma City, which had dissolved uh, uh, decades-long uh, uh, school desegregation order in Oklahoma City on the basis that there was no more problem left to fix and everything was fine, just fine, and nobody needed to worry anymore about racial justice in the Oklahoma City school system. And that was kind of disappointing, and it had happened the week before we were together, and the first thing I said to him when I met him was, boss, what do you think we ought to do about the Oklahoma City case? You think there's going to be more of it? He said, of course there's going to be more of it. If they know one thing, they know where the courthouse is. If all they got to do is go down there and file, then we're sunk. I said, okay, so what do you want to do? He said, drop a bomb on the court. Tell me which day it is, and I won't go to work. That was literally the last conversation we ever had about legal matter in his lifetime, and I forgot the lesson. 
I wouldn't be standing here today in quite the quandary that Yochai and I are in after a quarter of a century of this if I hadn't forgotten that lesson, which is you never win permanently. You, the other side just gets smarter. And that's what's happened, and that was what, what Yochai was saying this morning, and that's what I feel it's important to convey. What Yochai said, reduced to its essence for me, is that we did just good enough to have taught everybody else how to do it too, and now it is happening in every layer of the net that embraces humanity, and the one layer we thought we were winning in is just one layer. I still believe in free software with exactly the same degree of certainty that I believed in it before. It's just that I'm certain that my certainty is inadequate. It's just that I know that what I didn't know, what I wasn't thinking about, the lessons I wasn't learning from the reversibility of the march towards justice, were lessons that I should have taken more firmly and more completely to heart. Okay, fine. You can see that Yochai and I, though we have gotten old in our illusions, are not so old that we can't drop them. We do know now what we should have known sooner, which is that what we thought would be sufficient isn't sufficient and it may not even be fully necessary because there are other things we need to do. Two lessons follow from this, one of which applies to everybody in this room and the other one of which applies only to those of us who feel we are comrades in that particular campaign for freedom. In the latter group, what we need to understand is we have to generalize what we thought we were doing. We have to go past the simple proposition of share and share alike for software, or even the proposition of share and share alike for software and data and culture. The mere principle of share and share alike as a way of hacking copyright and the ancillary legal doctrines and problems we've been talking about, that will not be enough. If we are in this for the freedom of the human race under conditions of technological sophistication and control, if we are in this for a world of massive behavior collection and massive behavior modification through manipulation of people's wants and desires based on the deepest knowledge of them and all the patterns around them, then free software is not enough, free culture is not enough, free licensing is not enough. It may be necessary, we can figure that out as we go, but it isn't sufficient, and we need new broad general theory. And for those of us who get paid, at least in theory, to sit in our offices and cook up theory, that ought to be a, 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 you know, a smack on the rear and a, and a determination to get going. The second lesson, which is more general, not only to the comrades, but to all of us, uh, is that we're going to have to learn to treat the free software progress we have made as very fragile and very breakable. We're going to have to come to understand that the degree, particularly, of weakness being introduced into the system of copyleft, partly by its enemies and partly by its friends, could be fatal overall. We are not carrying a commons quite as robust as we thought, and we are certainly not carrying one which we can afford to throw around carelessly under the impression that as long as our motives are good and our zealotry is real, that we cannot break the thing we love because its idea is so good. That's wrong. That's flatly wrong. We are going to have to understand that we will lose more than we will win now by pushing the issues. That we are not going to succeed by marching on evil and that we are not going to succeed by any appeal to force even if we like to think that that force is just, you know, trivial force. Which doesn't mean that we can afford complete nonviolence either because we live in a scoundrel time. Because we are not safe, not only not from ourselves, we are not safe from ourselves, and we are not safe from the system, and we are not safe against regression of that in which we believe. We are going to have to play smarter still, not just at the level of a big theory which explains why free software is part of something else that altogether can save freedom in the 21st century. 
We're also going to have to resist our own arrogance and our own belief that if we just keep pushing harder along the same lines we've been pushing for, that we will win. We won't. What saved CompuLeft this far was that it was cooperative, not combative. What saved CompuLeft this far was that it was about trust, not compulsion. What saved CompuLeft this far was that it was about promises that we would never break and positions we would never change so that when we told people this is a win-win situation, they didn't have to think to themselves, well, maybe that's what they're going to say today, but what are they going to say tomorrow? So we are going to have to play by that rule. We're going to have to be completely reliable. We're going to have to be completely trustworthy. We're going to have to give people the same impression we gave them at the beginning, that it is our commitment to honesty and absolute commitment to the keeping of trust that makes us worth trusting in the first place. But we are also going to have to be damn careful that the people who are coming towards us are not people we are pushing away. I do not have any confidence whatever in our ability contentiously to get where we are going. None. I don't have any belief that this movement can be led by its warriors. I don't have any confidence that what we can turn this over to is a younger generation of people more uncompromising and more zealously determined to beat the bottom of the pot with the spoon than we were ourselves. That way lies disaster. So my political capital in all of this now is devoted to the proposition that we are going to have to work smarter and less contentiously that we are going to have to find ways to broaden the zone of win-win collaboration, that we're going to have to find ways to draw people to us on the basis of trust. And this is why Open Chain is, for me, the sum and substance of the meaning of all of that. Because, as Shane said this morning, this too is an exercise in trust and in the keeping of our word and in the helping of other people to understand rather than in the banging on people to do it or else. And because I say my political capital is committed there, I also mean that the only war I am prepared to fight is against my own comrades who don't believe what I've just told you. I am not prepared to use my force externally to try and compel people to believe our principles. I am only prepared externally to teach. I am only prepared externally to bring people to an agreement that they see as good on the basis of a trust they believe is complete. But I am prepared to do what I need to do to quell the f feeling in the opposite direction. I'm going to be quite uncompromising about that. I am not going to let the mistakes that I have made go down another generation and be reified in the wrong direction. That will not happen. That much I can keep from occurring. And by the time we meet again, this place, this time, next year, in the ever more summery weather on the beautiful Isle of Manhattan, <laughs> I will have proved to you that I mean what I say. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>